Hello everyone and welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. I have returned from a few days off traveling around the UK and I am back to sink my teeth into some cricket content. And of course, I always made cricket content. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the ongoing Cricket World Cup. And uh, we're at the pointy end of the season now, or the cup rather. And we're up to the semifinals in which Australia is obviously taking part. So the purpose of this video is to kind of discuss to what extent Australia could actually pull off, well, I guess an unlikely World Cup victory, especially if you've been following from the start of the tournament. So what we'll do in this video is recap a little bit about what's happened in the cup so far and talk about how realistic our chances are of winning the whole tournament. Before we crack into the video, if you would do me a favor and subscribe to the channel if you're new, that would be very much appreciated. Okay, so let's kick off with the narrative of how this tournament has gone from an Australian perspective so far. So first up, our first game of the tournament was against India and it got off to an inauspicious start. I hope that is the right word. I didn't look up the meaning, but it sounds right. But the Australian campaign got off to a really rough start getting bowled out by the hosts for 199. And generally speaking, well, that's not a great ODI score in general, but in India, a lot of the totals have been high. So 199 against the favorites to win the entire tournament was a bad start. And sure enough, despite having India three wickets for two runs early in their chase, they cruised to a six wicket victory. This was then backed up by a performance against South Africa that left us with, well, a lot less confidence that we might have had going into that game because we were crushed again by 140 runs against the Proteas. They made 311 batting first and we misfired to be six for 70 at one point and like I said, bowled out for 171 all up. But thankfully, this game sort of proved to be a little bit of a turning point because we uh, pulled our fingers out of our gluteus maximus after this, taking on Sri Lanka. And after their top order made a pretty strong start, we recovered to take nine for 52, bowl them out for 209 and get our first win of the tournament by five wickets. The fourth match against Pakistan is really where we started to look like we might have blown out a few cobwebs at least. After 33.4 overs at one point, we were zero wickets for 259 runs. Now, we kind of left a few runs on the board in this game because we only scored 367 all up, which from the position we were in was quite disappointing. But we would hold off for a big win, although the concern around our toothless bowling, and that's the word I would use to describe it, toothless, meant that we still conceded 305 runs against Pakistan, but we notched our second win. We then had a game against the Dutch, and the Netherlands, from what I've seen, have actually been a pretty tricky opponent this tournament so far, and they are one of only two teams to beat South Africa in this tournament. So I had my doubts that we would punish them, but that we did. Warner made back-to-back -back centuries, and Maxwell bobbed up with a 40-ball century, which just incredible and we won that game by 309 runs so then we had a big clash against New Zealand who of course have taken part in the last two World Cup finals and are in any tournament considered a big team so we made 388 and that seems like happy days sure but we'd only scored one run off the last couple of overs and it felt like it once again we'd left runs on the table and this nearly cost us because our bowling was shocking in this game we only won by five runs in this game in particular, someone like a Mitch Stark was badly exposed. He bowled nine overs and took no wickets for 89 runs. At the end of the day though, a win's a win and we beat one of the other major contenders for the top four. We then came up against a struggling England side and thankfully did just enough to win the game, largely thanks to an all-round performance by Adam Zampa, who hit a late 29 off 19, which ended up being pretty important runs, and then taking three for 21 with the ball. So at this point of the tournament, with two games left in the group stages, the wins were ticking over and we're looking a lot more promising than our start to the tournament. But there has been, at this point, very concerning form in different areas, which we'll elaborate on later. And some of this concerning form was present in the final two games and exemplified in our performances against Afghanistan and Bangladesh. So to start off, I, I've already covered the Glenn Maxwell performance against Afghanistan, where he scored a double century and we won in dramatic fashion. But we do have to factor in as well, Afghanistan Stan made a very strong total of 291 runs against us and forced us to chase down the largest ever chase at that particular ground. Thankfully, we did it, but we were 7 for 91 at one point during that game. At this point, we'd already qualified for the semifinals safe and sound, so we had one last sort of dead rubber against Bangladesh. But again, we would have liked to see in this particular game some more convincing form. So with the ball, we conceded 306 runs against the Bangladesh side, who has been pretty up and down, but mostly down this tournament. In addition to that, both of our opening bowlers, our strike bowlers, go wicketless in this game. Thankfully, our top order sort of fired. Warner made a 50, Steve Smith made a 50, and Mac 
And Mitch Marsh also went large with a massive 177, which, you know, he probably would have made a double century if he had more overs and runs to chase. So that is a snapshot of how Australia has gone in the tournament so far. So let's talk about some key issues with this particular team and their performance in this tournament. Now, the primary issue that faces Australia in between now and the actual World Cup final is the fact that we have to get through the two teams that annihilated us in the group stages to win the overall tournament. So Australia plays South Africa in the second semi final and if they win that they're going to play the winner of India New Zealand although you can probably have a pretty safe bet that India is going to be the likely finalist in that game now thankfully what I will say for us and I'm, it sounded like a pretty negative video so far is that our form has improved since the start of the season and we've come a long way since those early tournament defeats to those teams India on the one hand they've gone undefeated haven't really looked troubled at all and we'll go into some more compelling stats about that particular side shortly South Africa on the other hand they have lost two games overall one to India, who went undefeated, like I said, and the other one to the Dutch, which was at the time, well, not just at the time, it stands out as a real outlier in this tournament. The Netherlands have played some really good cricket and South Africa were on the wrong end of them that day. So in the spirit of opposition analysis, let's look at some of the stats that concern us about India and South Africa in this particular tournament. First of all, the two leading run scorers of this tournament are Virat Kohli and Quentin de Kock, the number one and two leading run scorers. India also has the top three bowlers in this tournament in terms of economy rate, which is outstanding when you think about it. Ashwin, Bumrah, and Jadeja are all going at less than four runs and over, which is just crazy in a particularly high scoring tournament. In general, in modern ODI cricket, that is outstanding. Mohamed Shami from India also has a bowling average of this tournament of less than 10. I forget how to pronounce his name. I did see it when I was watching the game, but I forgot it. But Co it's spelled Coatsy. Uh, he's got a particular pronunciation of it. And Janssen, they're also ranked third and fifth uh, in the entire tournament for wickets taken. Janssen as well has a strike rate of 19.81, which is better than any Australian bowler. So we're coming up against some pretty strong individuals in very good sides. Now, our other biggest issue facing us in this semi-final and then potentially a final as well, I think our biggest to heal is clearly our bowling attack. So we do have the leading wicket taker in this tournament in Adam Zampa. He's taken an outstanding 22 wickets at an average of 18.9. I must admit, I've been a casual cricket fan over the years. Didn't really think Zampa was that good, but he's been outstanding this tournament at stop. The next best is Josh Hazelwood, who's taken 12 wickets at an average of 31.41, which is a fair way below some of the better performed bowlers in this tournament. So there's a big gap between our best and our second best. Then I think we also have to address the elephant in the room in Mitch Stark. And while he's one of the most decorated ODI bowlers, particularly in World Cups, in recent times. His form this tournament has been a serious concern. He's taken 10 wickets at an average of 43.9 and an economy rate of six and a half. Now that is concerning in isolation, but Pat Cummins, who from the eye test I thought had been performing a lot better, is very similar. 10 wickets at an average of 43 and an economy of 6.15. So on these Indian wickets, which obviously tend to turn, Adam Zampa is doing his job as the wrist spinner and the seamers have been largely ineffectual in this particular tournament. It gets worse as well though. The middle overs bowling has been a real problem for us. In particular, the bowling form from our all-rounders in this tournament has really let us down. So we'll go through a few of them. There's Mitch Marsh. He's bowled 11 overs and he's taken two for 91. So that's an economy rate of 8.27. Again, Mitch Marsh is making runs. It'd be great if we just see him as a part-timer, sure. But when you look through the other options, it doesn't really get a whole lot better. There's Stoinis. He's taken four for 143 of 19 overs. That's an economy rate of 7.5. Again, I know that Stoinis is meant to bowl a little bit at the death, so the economy rate might, you know, swing out a little bit. I don't understand that. Maxwell is probably the pick of all the middle overs bowlers. His bowling average is 52, which is not great, but at least his economy rate has been less than five. And at the end of the day, he is kind of a dart bowling middle overs part-timer. That's fine. But we're really lacking not just a good fifth bowler or sixth bowling option in this particular tournament, but number three, number four, and five, six, seven, they've all been largely ineffectual. So with the ball, we've been largely toothless. Our strike bowlers aren't really getting the job done. And there has been a clear history now of you know, average teams making good totals against us, which means we're constantly in the position of having to make 350 runs or 380 runs against New Zealand to actually win a game. 
So we can look at our batting, which has been, you know, clearly a relative strength in this particular tournament. We've had three batsmen averaging over 50, which is a good sign. One of them is David Warner. He's been really consistent, a leading run scorer at 499 runs at an average of 55 and scoring at 105 as in terms of his strike rate. Mitch Marsh has also had a really good tournament with the bat, which is why I give him a little bit of a reprieve for not bowling so well. I think he's clearly a better batsman anyway. He's made 426 runs. He's averaging 60.85 and his strike rate is 109.5. So those guys, consistently getting it done for Australia in this tournament. Then, of course, Glenn Maxwell is the next best. He scored 379 runs at an average of 79.4 and a strike rate of 152. So he's got two massive hundreds. Well, he's got a double hundred and a hundred, which kind of skewed those figures a little bit. But he has absolutely gotten the job done and proven to be an okay fifth or sixth bowling choice. So what I will say, though, you know, looking at our batting, while there's clear improvements that can be made in our bowling, that's where we've been ineffectual. There's still some upside with our batting as well. When you look at someone like a Steve Smith, who's averaged just 38.28 this tournament with a high score of 71. Obviously, he scored 60-odd not out against Bangladesh as well, so that average was lower. Labashain only averaging 35.75 as well. Again, a high score of 71. Hasn't really made a statement in this particular tournament or really pushed Australia into being in winning positions. Cummins, funnily enough, averages 28.5 with the bat, and that would not be concerning if not for the fact that he's averaging more with the bat than Stoinis, Green, and Inglis, and slightly just below Travis Head. So what we're seeing is we're getting too much contribution from too few in this particular tournament. And while things are going better, this is a clear opportunity for Australia to improve on to potentially be a threat in the semi-final and final. So while this actually has been you know, quite a negatively toned video, on the other hand, I think we can make a strong case for improvement coming from some of these guys who we know can do better. We know Cummins and Stark can be devastating bowlers. We know Steve Smith can win games off his own bat. So the upside is there. We just need to catch someone like a South Africa in particular. We need to focus on South Africa first. We need to catch them on an off day because we know historically South Africa do not perform well in these big tournaments. In fact, I don't think they've been in a World Cup final. I'm going to say ever. I'm not too sure. I know since about 1996, they definitely haven't been in one. I do think we're a chance because I think the momentum we're on at the moment is currently, well, we've just come a long way since we played South Africa in that early group stage game. So I'm confident that we're going to give it a good shot, but I think the improvement clearly needs to come from the bowlers, in particular, our ability to take wickets through the middle overs and not concede eight runs and over when it counts. And Mitch Stark, if you're watching, and I know you're a huge true footy fan, Please stop bowling knee-high full tosses and the occasional beamer in your death bowling. Please stop. But anyway, guys, that is my take on Australia's prospects of winning the World Cup. I'd say we start both games underdogs, and it's going to take a monumental effort for anyone to beat India. They're a clear favorite, and it would take something ridiculous for them to not win the tournament at this stage. It would be nice to buck the trend of hosts winning the World Cup. It happened uh, 2019, 2015, and 2011. So you have to go back to the Caribbean in 2007 when Australia won it for the last time the host didn't win the World Cup. So I'm kind of also praying New Zealand can spark an upset because they certainly have the power to do that. They probably could beat India in the right conditions. Hopefully they do us a favor and we take care of South Africa. Anyway, guys, those were just my musings and ramblings on the World Cup. By all means, let me know your opinion in the comments section below. The semifinals in a couple of days now, I will absolutely be watching and hopefully I'll be able to do a video on how Australia has just qualified for the World Cup in a few days. But looking forward to it anyway. I love World Cups. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.